Good morning. I'm Melissa Harris Perry. Yesterday, President Obama shocked everyone when he appeared unannounced in the White House briefing room to speak about Trayvon Martin and his own experiences as a black man in America. You know, uh, when uh, Trayvon Martin was first shot, uh, I said that this could have been my son. Uh, another way of saying that is uh, Trayvon Martin could have been me uh, 35 years ago. Powerful words from the most powerful man in America. The president went on to say how despite the office he holds today, he has been seen by strangers as a potential thief, a violent criminal. There are very few African-American men in this country who haven't had the experience of being followed when they were shopping in a department store. That includes me. There are very, very few African-American men who haven't had the experience of walking across the street and hearing uh, the locks click on the doors of cars. That happens to me, at least before I was a senator. There are very few African Americans who haven't had the experience of getting on an elevator and a woman clutching her purse uh, nervously uh, and holding her breath until she had a chance to get off. That happens often. The president did not announce a major new legislative agenda yesterday. He did not launch a new presidential commission. But what he did was groundbreaking. And, and let me offer why. Democracy is an entirely unique way of governing. It relies not on the raw power of the state to enforce and maintain order, but on the consent of the governed. Democracy begins with the assumption that the reason governments exist, the only legitimate basis on which they can exist, is for the good of the people. The promise of democracy is that the people, all of us, will be seen and recognized as unique individuals, not as stigma or stereotypes, but as people. Recognition is a promise unfulfilled for African Americans. And that is what the president argued in such clear and personal terms yesterday. To be a black man is to be misrecognized as a criminal, as a threat, as a danger, when perhaps you're just a worker, a father, a kid on the way home with a bag of candy. More than 100 years ago, W.E.B. Du Bois called misrecognition a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. So on Friday, when America's first black president stood at the podium of the White House press briefing room and spoke both as president of the United States, and as a black man. At the same time, he, he knit together that double consciousness. He did something that no other president has ever done so fully. He saw us. And he demanded that the rest of the country recognize the black experience as valid, as real, and as worthy of recognition and discussion. When you think about why, in the African American com community at least, um, there's a lot of pain around what happened here. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that um, the African-American community is looking at this issue through uh, a set of experiences and a, and a history that, uh, that doesn't go away. These experiences are real, he said. This happens and it hurts. And, and here's the breathtaking part. It matters that black people hurt. When we fail to see, we corrode the very basis of democracy. On Friday, President Obama told America, Trayvon Martin could have been me 35 years ago. But what went unsaid is this. Perhaps in 35 years, Trayvon Martin could have been President Obama. But we will never know because Trayvon was misrecognized, assumed to be a criminal when he was just a kid trying to get home. Joining me now, Ohio State Senator Nina Turner, NBC News Vice President Val Nichols, who this week wrote a column for MSNBC.com on his own experiences as an African-American man. Tim Wise, an educator and author of Dear White America, and Khalil Muhammad of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Well, I actually want to start with you, because when I heard the president say... Trayvon Martin could have been me. I thought, of course, immediately of your piece that you wrote this week saying 
I, I could have been Trayvon Martin. Yeah, he's always stealing my stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, the interesting thing about that, uh, uh, the trial, was those incidents where I faced police guns as a teenager were buried. I'd forgotten all about them mm -hmm. and for years and years, decades. And as this trial came up, it was like, oh, you know what? <laughs> I remember that. Right. I remember twice looking down barrels of police guns only because, you know, somebody thought I was suspicious. And uh, uh, it was a, a life-defining experience because what I realized at that point was um, that the color of my skin was not only going to um, invite racism and other things, but it could actually get me killed mm -hmm. or jailed. And that was an interesting realization at 17, 18 years old. This point, I felt, Khalil, was, was the, the thread that President Obama was, was trying to weave into this story to talk about the daily slights, the not getting a cab, the, the sense of, of lack of belonging can sometimes be seen as just racial grievance. Like, well, you know, everybody's got problems. Get over yourself. Mm -hmm. But when you connect it, to the life and death consequences, when you connect it to the Trayvon Martin, suddenly it becomes something bigger. Well, I, I think not only is that the key thread here, but I think this, this reference to these microaggressions also work in two ways. They work from the standpoint of eliciting this kind of backlash, oh, stop whining. Yeah. But they also function in a way that it's a kind of like, well, black people get what they deserve because they put themselves in a position to live poorer lives, to perform less well in school, to live in dangerous neighborhoods. And ultimately, it essentially says we have no responsibility for even the slights because yep. the slights are reasonable. Yep. One of the things that's most telling about this moment, and we keep hearing so much about how post-racialism isn't the era of the Obama age, that we're not in a post-race age, is that a hundred years ago when Du Bois was writing that, one of the things that he was writing against in that zeitgeist, in that yes. particular moment, was the sense that whites had said, we've done everything that we yes. can do. We're talking, we, we're talking yes. turn of the 20th century. That's right. Yeah. We passed civil rights amendments in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Yep. We have solved the, 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 the problem of race in America. Mm -hmm. Now the states are back to doing what they're, they're supposed to do. We're 50 years past slavery. What are y'all whining about? Exactly. Yep. So Du Bois is actually bringing to bear a response to an earlier post-racial zeitgeist yep. that is trying to unravel the complexities of being black in America. Look, this point for me is so critical because it is a reminder that this, is, this isn't just post-Jim Crow, post-civil rights movement, right? That this is always the response back. Tim, I, I want to ask you because part of what I found fascinating about this response mm -hmm. was the ways in which it was quite different than 2008. I want to listen to a moment in the 2008 race speech in Philadelphia mm -hmm. where the president talks about racial profiling, but he talks about it in the context of his white grandmother. Let's listen for a moment. I can no more disown him than I can disown my white grandmother, a woman who helped raise me, a woman who sacrificed again and again for me, a woman who loves me as much as she loves anything in this world, but a woman who once confessed her fear of black men who passed her by on the street. So it feels to me in 08, part of what he was trying to do in that scripted sort of save the campaign speech was to, to talk about the black experience, but also the white one and to give. And this time it was just all let me explain to you how this feels. Right, right. Well, I think the difference is there's a tragedy that precipitated the need for this answer. Mm -hmm. So it's got to be more heartfelt. It's mm -hmm. not a political damage control speech, which the Philadelphia speech for all of its supposed grandeur was. I think what we as white folks have got to deal with in this is it, it can't be for President Obama to call out these realities alone. We have got to mm -hmm. begin to be honest finally, because not only is white America in denial, I think by and large, with exceptions duly known noted about racism in 2013. As we just said, they were in denial during Du Bois Day in the early 60s. I've mentioned it on your show before. Yeah. Even before civil rights laws were passed, 80, 90 percent of white Americans said yeah. there was no problem. Black folks are treated equally. What are you complaining about? If we are unable to see black reality mm -hmm. for what it is, then we're not going to be able to move forward. It's one thing to disagree about a verdict. Yes. It's quite another to look at black people yep. and say, you know that thing you think is happening? It's, it's not. not. You're yes. crazy. Yes. You're hallucinating. That's yep. fundamentally arrogant, and to the extent it has a racial element to it, it's fundamentally racist. See, that, to me, that's so useful. This is not, an acknowledgement of the black experience does not mean agreement on the verdict, right? right. It means an agreement about the, the ability to speak to your own experience. Nina, I just have to ask you before we go to this break, 
The president talked about things that had happened to him in the past. He said, before I was a senator, I experienced these microaggressions. But also, this is the president who was asked to show his birth certificate, who was asked, to, who, who basically experienced that sense of, what are you doing here, kid? Mm -hmm. Show me, boy, mm -hmm. what, that you belong here. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder if he sees it that way or like it certainly it came to mind for me, that birtherism. Yeah, and it's, it's true. And the, and the president really captured the essence mm -hmm. of what it means to be black in America. And although he is the president of the United States, he can have a flashback about his journey mm -hmm. as an African-American boy and now an African-American man. I have a son who's 23 years old. He could have been mm -hmm. Trayvon. Can you imagine birthing a child in the world and knowing from the moment when I, I experience pleasure because he was healthy, yes. but at the same time in that birthing room saying that my son is going to have to carry the burden of his blackness. Yep. God, please bless him. Yes. And that, I, that, that piece. Yeah. Yep. It, okay. Painful. Painful. And, and, and all, all that he was asking was this pain matters. Recognize, yes. just acknowledge, yes. acknowledge that it exists. Yes. We'll be back on this topic in just a moment.